tonight I just want to share some things. Uh, how many know that God is body conscious? Not physical body conscious, but in a church, he's conscious of us all. And we should fit together as the cells of a human body. So I want to talk about that. I'm not sure how far I'm going to get tonight. I got a little tangent I'm going to get off on in to start with. We are living in where it's obvious that we're the generation prior to Jesus' return. And it's uncanny as you read the scriptures how accurate the detail is about what the Bible says times would be like just before Jesus comes back. Second Timothy 3, this is... Uh, Amplified, the classic Amplified. I want to read that to begin with, but understand this, that in the last days will come or set in perilous times of great stress and trouble, uh, hard to deal with and hard to bear. Everybody say perilous. I looked up the Greek word for perilous there. It's only found two times in the New Testament. The other time that it's used is uncanny and strange. You remember the man uh, that's talked about, is talked about in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the man, the demon-possessed man that was living in the graveyard? You remember? Well, it says he was exceedingly fierce. And that's that same word, perilous. And it's only, that's the only other time that it's used in the New Testament. And it could easily be the Holy Spirit's telling us something about the days that we're living in. In fact, uh, look over at Matthew chapter 5. And I want you to see this. I think that's where I am. Yeah. Uh, turn over there and let's read that. 6, 5, I'm wrong. Here, Mark 5. Here we are. Mark 5, 1 there came to the other side of the sea to the country of the Gadarenes. And when he had come out of the boat immediately, there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs. No one could bind him, not even with chains. So this word perilous in 2 Timothy 3, 1 also describes this man here with that word fierce. He lived in the tombs. That is, he was obsessed with death. And it's really odd and uncanny that here, uh, this verse in 2 Timothy 3, 1, I'm trying to stop this. Hang on, y'all. I got to keep my uh, iPad from uh, messing up on me here. Here we go. It's uncanny that um, this same word is used to describe this man of the tombs. He was obsessed with death. And it's really and it's strange that the culture today is obsessed with death. I still walk around and see pictures of skull bones and crosses and, and skulls on people's clothes. And I'm figuring, and they even put it on their bodies and, and tattoos. I'm thinking, why do you have this obsession with death? And then our young people are often, because they have so many emotional problems, they're cutting themselves. There's an obsession with death. What is that telling you? What, what, what Jesus said and what the Apostle Paul said about the last days being perilous or fierce. It's true today and the characteristics that were in this man's life is upon the whole world right now. What's this? And it said uh, because he had often been bound. Uh, I'm sorry, who had his dwelling among tombs. And then it says no one could bind him not even with chains. Because he'd often been bound with shackles, chains. The chains had been pulled apart by him and the shackles broken in pieces. Neither could anyone tame him. Here was a man that was out of control. And we've got a culture, a whole world that is out of control now. Would you agree? It's uncanny. Then it says, and always night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out, cutting himself with stones. That's sadomasochism. He was a sexual deviant, and sexual deviancy is all around us, all over the world, and it's come out of the closet, and it's everywhere. Would you agree? So we could go on, and maybe you can read that in your own time. I might come back and examine that a little more closely, but all that's wrapped up in that word, perilous, fierce. Uh, and then the Amplified brings it out, uh, times of great stress and trouble, hard to deal with, and hard to bear for people will be lovers of self and utterly self-centered. Now, 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 this is the occupation of the world today. Everybody's concerned. The most, uh, the most important person in most people in our culture's life is themselves. And that's what's going on today. So life revolves around I, me, 
my and mine. And if it doesn't affect me, if it's, you know, I, the most important person in my world is me. And if I don't like you, I won't have anything to do with you. If I don't like what you're thinking, I don't like what you're doing, I won't have anything to do with you because the most important person in my world is me. How many know that's the world today? I'm saying all this because we're all challenged once we leave the four walls of this building or you turn off the Facebook feed, everything around us is this. And so he says, the number one thing here is self-centered living. People will be lovers of self, utterly self-centered, lovers of money. And because they love themselves, they're looking for all the money they can get to make themselves feel good about what they're doing with themselves. So he says, uh, uh, lovers of money aroused by an inordinate or greedy desire for wealth, proud, arrogant, contemptuous boasters, They will be abusive, blasphemous, scoffing, disobedient to parents. So so the normal respect for authority is not there in this culture. And, And you could go even further and say this, the respect for law is not there. You could take that to the extreme. How many know if you can't obey your parent, I always taught my kids, if you can't obey me, you won't obey the owner of the store, the teacher, the police officer, one day bars may hold you, right? So there's a lot there that, boy, we don't have time to talk about. Uh, disobedient to parents, ungrateful ingrates. They think everybody uh, owes them something and are grateful for nothing. Unholy and profane, that is, they think nothing of spiritual verities, realities, God, his word, his ways, uh, it's disdained by them. Uh, They will be without natural human affection, callous and inhuman, lacking love for kinsmen. One translation says lack of family love, lack of care for people that you should be endeared to. It epitomizes this day and age. Um, Relentless admitting of no truce or appeasement. They will be slanderers. Watch this word, wrong words being used to the extreme, false accusers, troublemakers, intemperate, intemperate and loose in morals and conduct, uncontrolled and fierce. They're lacking self-control in every area of their life, haters of good. They'll be treacherous betrayers, rash, inflated with self-conceit. They'll be lovers of sensual pleasures and vain amusements more than and rather than lovers of God. I want you to notice it doesn't say they won't love God. Amplified brings out rather than, but actually if you go look up the original word in the Greek language, it says they love God, but they love themselves more. And they love their pleasure more. And it affects what they do in their church life. And it affects how they relate to each other. And if it doesn't fit in my agenda, I'm not going to do it. So again, uh, selfishness is at the core here. And it brings it out there when he says, uh, They will be lovers of sensual pleasures, vain amusements more than, rather than lovers of God. For although they hold a form of piety, true religion, they deny and reject and are strangers to the power of it. Their conduct belies the genuineness of their profession. And then he adds, avoid all such people, turn away from them. New Living Translation, uh, much simpler, says, you should know this, Timothy. The last days, there'll be very difficult times. People will love only themselves and their money. They'll be boastful, proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents, and ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. They'll be unloving, unforgiving. They'll slander others and have no self-control. They'll be cruel and hate what is good. They'll betray their friends, be reckless, be puffed up with pride, love pleasure rather than God. They'll act religious, but they'll reject the power that can make them godly. Stay away from people like that. So, so, you know, the idea here is that's all around us right now. Would you agree with that in the American culture that you're living in? And now just about anywhere you go in the world, it's that way. Would you agree? And now we have the world at our fingertips with the internet. And you can see all of the terrible, terrible things happening all around as well. reason I want to mention the things I'm going to talk about is because that's the culture that we're living in. And every generation has the challenge of keeping the world out of the church. Would you agree? We're in the world. We're not of the world. We're in the world. And and it can easily... It can easily soak into your life. That is the things that are in our culture that people take for granted that it's okay to do. How many know what was not accepted 
two generations ago is normal now. What was accepted a generation ago is becoming acceptable now. Would you agree with that? I mean, hey, just 20 years ago, things that people wouldn't consider are now mainstream. Would you agree with that? And, you know, I've lived long enough now that when I was a kid, there were some things you wouldn't even talk about that are common mainstream conversation now. Is that true? And, and so there's a, there's a slowing down of morals, and that's why we need to talk about these things. And I, as pastor, one of my responsibilities is to warn us of the age we're living in and, and just to shore us up and make sure we stay on the straight and narrow. Is that okay? So... Um, so, so there's several things that I want to mention here. You know, in, in my life, if you knew me, one thing I'm big on is preventative maintenance. Uh, I have a lawnmower. I have a bicycle. Cy- I cycle. I have two automobiles. And, uh, and then I have a house I take care of. And with everything in my life, I'm big on maintaining I'm big on car maintenance. I maintain my car at regular intervals. I mean, I'm the kind of person, I I even change the oil in my differential. Some people don't even know what that is. I I change the brake fluid in my brake system in my automobile. Most people don't even touch it till it breaks down. Well, I believe in preventative maintenance, and I do that with my lawnmower, do it with my bicycle. Why? Because I want it to last a long time. And if I know if I do preventative maintenance, I don't want to be the one stuck on the side road. Can you help me? Because I got enough sense to do. Pre- because if you don't, what you don't maintain will break, and it'll break down. And it'll be inconvenient. So, you know, I, I relate. That's my natural life. Do you know I do the same thing in a spiritual life? There's certain things that I do regularly. It's not convenient. It's not fun. Sometimes I don't enjoy it. Sometimes I'm tired. Sometimes I'm sleepy. But I get in the Word every single day. I put my nose in this book when I don't feel like it, when I don't think I don't need it. I pray in other tongues. I pray every single day. Not because I feel like it, because it's preventative maintenance. Because I know the the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And you know what? My, the road of my life is littered with people that I know who didn't take the time to do preventative maintenance on their life, and it costs them. I have a number of my friends that haven't lived as long as I have. They died some years ago. I had a friend just die, a couple of friends this year that were in school with me. I'm telling you, preventative maintenance works. How many hear me? Physically, spiritually, naturally. Here we're talking spiritually. So we got some preventative maintenance here. And then, and then I was taking a walk while I was praying this afternoon. And I was walking by everybody's yard in my neighborhood and just looking. And uh, see, I do preventative maintenance on my yard. And if you go look at my yard, I have no weeds in my yard. And then I, when I walk today, you know what I noticed? There are weeds everywhere. Some people, they got a nice, a nice, real nice crop of flowers in their yard where there should be grass because the little weeds have this little white flowers that poke up. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah. So you know what that tells them? That person's not taking, they could, and maybe they're busy, I get it. A lot of people don't do anything. That grass is aggravating to them. All they do is mow it. But then it's hard to enjoy it because once you mow it, one day and a half later, you got this little weed that sticks up and it grows real fast. And you say, Lord, I just cut that grass. So, you know, I take care of the weeds in my yard because I want a nice, it's just me. I just like taking care of things, right? So if you don't take care of your life, weeds will grow. Is that true? It's a hassle for me to take care of my yard. You don't know. I just put 80 pounds of lime down. Last week when I was on vacation, I just put uh, several different kinds of, uh, of uh, weed controllers on it. And then I put some lawn food on it. Was that fun? No, it messed my shoes up. I had to wash my shoes. It messed my shoes up doing that. I got hot. It was sweating. I got tired. But you know what? I got a nice green lawn. Go look at it. Well, you don't have to look at it. But you see what I'm saying? Now, you see what happens. What you do naturally, you'll do spiritually. If you're a person that hardly ever takes care of something, you need to be careful with you because you may not be taking care of you. How many hear me? If I can't take care of natural things, could God trust me to take care of spiritual things? It's a question, isn't it? If I couldn't take care of my own life, could, could God trust me to take care of you? Right? 
So think that way about your life. What are you doing to take care of you? So this is preventative maintenance. Start a little series tonight. And I want to talk about some things that we should be aware of as a church body. The stats are that in America, uh, people go to church less than two times a month. That's terrible. There's no way that we're going to make a spiritual impact in our culture going to church together as a family less than two times a month. It's, it's not possible to get what you should get just on Facebook feed. Yes or no? Said all these things a lot of times. We need to be together. There are reasons for that. There are purposes behind it. I want you to see that. Number one that I want you to know tonight is remember that God is body conscious. Everybody say body conscious. Not physically, but spiritually. How many know that every cell in your human body contains the DNA of your whole body? Every cell in my body recognizes Mitch Horton. Every cell's got the DNA that make up me. You could take a cell of my body and if they knew how, grow me. DNA. The cells of my body all over my body. We have billions and billions of cells. Every single one of them t- contains the microcosm, Mitch Horton, and your body does the same with you. And the cells of your body recognize one another. Now, in a church, we need to have the same DNA. Yes or no? We fit together like the cells of body. Yes or no? So we need to have the same DNA, make sure we go in the same direction. How many hear what I'm saying? And the only way we can do that is we get together. So I want to encourage you, come to the services, attend, come on Sunday mornings, come on Wednesday nights. We got special times, be involved. Be involved in small groups, be involved in in serving others on our dream team. Why? Because it helps you uh, obtain and keep up with the DNA that is in our church, the DNA of Victory Church. I put it in my personal notes. I don't think it may be on the screen there. Uh, is, Is faith, love, unity, care, helpfulness, faithfulness, considerateness. Would you agree with that? Y'all ain't even talking. Is that the DNA of our cult? That's, that's the DNA of Victory Church. It's all about God. It's all about love. It's all about his word. It's all about trusting him. It's about putting ourselves last and others first. Yes or no? That's our DNA. If you hang around us, you partake of our DNA. The only way you partake of the DNA of Victory Church is we put ourselves where that DNA is, is constantly talked about and constantly pushed and constantly moved. Division, strife, deceit, gossip, self-centeredness is not of God and it's not part of our DNA. Would you agree with that? So let's go a little further. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12. This is message paraphrase. And uh, Eugene Peterson did a, a really great job here of describing the human body and just how it relates. And this is so unlike the culture we're in right now. The self-centered, I, me, my, mind culture. It's at work, it's on the job, it's in our neighborhoods, it's all around us. And we've got to be willing to let the DNA of God inside of us repel that constantly. How many hear me? So he's got a great thing to say here. Listen to 1 Corinthians 12, where Paul compares the human body to the body of Christ or the body of Christ to the human body. And uh, the paraphrase here is just great. You can easily enough see how this kind of thing works by looking no further than your own body. Your body has many parts, limbs, organs, cells. But no matter how many parts you can name, you're still one body. It's exactly the same with Christ. By means of his one spirit, we all said goodbye to our partial and piecemeal lives. We each used to independently call our own shots. But then we entered into a large and integrated life in which he has the final say in everything. This is what we proclaimed in word and action when we were baptized. Each of us is now part of his resurrection body, refreshed and sustained at one fountain, his spirit, where we all come to drink. The old labels we once used to identify ourselves, labels like Jew, Greek, slave, free, are no longer useful. We need something larger, more comprehensive. And in American culture, see, this is not popular. In American culture today, and I'm telling you, it is seeped into the church world. The idea is I do what I want to do, when I want to do it, the way I want to do it. And if you don't like it, I'm going to find somebody else. 
I'll go find somewhere else. I'll go shopping. I'll go church hopping and I'll go church shopping because life is not about, you know, me flowing with you. Life is about me finding what pleases me. And if you can't please me, I'll go somewhere else. You know what that does? It hinders the body of Christ and it hinders the moving of the Holy Spirit. Yes or no? So God's got to do something grand and great. I don't know what he's got up his sleeve. It's got to be something great for us to unify, take our eyes off of us and put our eyes on him and his kingdom. Life is bigger than me and what I like. That went over big. I don't know. I thought it was good anyway. So he goes on and says here, I want you to think about how all this makes you more significant, not less. A body isn't just a single part blown into something huge. It's all the different but similar parts arranged and functioning together. Everybody say together. If foot said I'm not elegant like hand, embellished with rings, I guess I don't belong to the body. Would that make it so? If ear said I'm not beautiful like eye, limpid and expressive, I don't deserve a place in the head. Would you want to remove it from the body? Of course not. If the body was an eye, all eye, how could it hear If all ear, how could it smell as it is? We see that God has carefully placed each part of the body right where he wanted it. But I also want you to think about how this keeps your uh, your significance from getting blown up into self-importance. How many know God's given each one of us gifts, talents, and things that we're good at? Yes or no? And in Victory Church, there are th- people who are skilled, people that, ha- are, uh, that have abilities that you don't have, and the things that you can do that others can't do. And how many know our goal is we want you to grow up and be able to be used in the gifts and skills that God has given you, yes or no? And that means that nobody's better than others. Just because the skill that God gave me was, was teaching, I didn't have that in and of myself. Jesus gave it to me when I got saved. I have, if I don't use that, just because I'm a mouth doesn't mean I'm, I'm more important than a put person who's a stomach or an intestine or a heart or a finger or a toe or a toenail for that matter, right? Because we all need each other. Is that true? That's what he's saying. So he goes on to say here, uh, when it's the parts of, let me see, where it was I? Here we are. Uh, Verse 23, let's start there. When it's a part of your body you're concerned with, it makes no difference whether the part is visible or clothed higher or lower. Lower, You give it dignity and honor just as it is without comparisons. If anything, you have more concern for the lower parts than the higher. If you had to choose, wouldn't you prefer good digestion to full-bodied hair? And I can tell you that's absolutely true. The way God designed our bodies is a model for understanding our lives together as a church. Every part dependent on every other part. The parts we mention, the parts we don't. The parts we see and the parts we don't. If one part hurts, every other part is involved in the hurt and in the healing. If one flourishes, Every other part enters into the exuberance. How many heard what he just said? Now, you know, that cuts completely crosswise of American culture today. And it's worse now than it ever has been. Now, if I've got a problem, I'm going to keep it to myself, not tell anybody, because it's too shaming for me to admit that I have a need or that there is a lack. How many know that's not right? How many know we belong together? How many know if I hurt, you're supposed to grieve with me and pray for me? How many know if you hurt or you're having a problem, if I know about that, I don't look down on you. I love you. And I want to embrace you and care for you and pray for you. Is that the way it should be? In American culture right now, it's all about, it's all about me protecting my turf, protecting my image. And I just read a statistic that was quite alarming. Uh, uh, suicides across the board in every state are up. Uh, a high percentage uh, just in the last few years and they think it's tied to social media and, uh, and the stigmas that occur when people find out that you are not doing as well as your social standing on media says you are, etc. You hear what I'm saying? We're a family, we're a body and church life, the way it's supposed to work is we love each other, we care about each other, we're vulnerable with each other. If I ache, I'll let you know, would you please pray for me? If you're hurting, you come and say, man, I just need you today, man. 
Would you pray for me? How many know we're missing that in American culture and it's costing us deeply? And now our children are being deeply, deeply affected. Now even by suicide, many are cutting themselves and doing things and they're having emotional problems that uh, previous generations haven't had to deal with. But it's because of the fast-pacedness of life and it's because of all this information we're all ingesting instead of this. How many hear what I'm saying? So it goes on to say, you're a Christ body. That's who you are. You must never forget this. Only as you accept your part of that body does your part mean anything. Number two, we create an atmosphere. How many know together in this building, when we come together, we create an atmosphere where God can do something? Yes or no? Ephesians chapter 2, 19. So now this is New Living Translation. So now you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. You're citizens along with all God's holy people. You're members of God's family. Together, everybody say together. We are his house. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. The cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. We are carefully joined together in him. Would you say that with me out loud? We are carefully joined together in him, becoming a holy temple for the Lord. Through you, him, you Gentiles also being made part of this dwelling where God lives by his spirit. Verse 21, where it says becoming a holy temple from the, for the Lord. When we get together, we become a temple, and it, the Greek word there is naos, and that's the word for the holy of holies in the Old Testament temple that was, uh, that was you know, cut apart when, when Jesus was raised from the dead, and the curtain that separated it from the rest, rest of the temple was cut off. But it's talking about the place where God lives, the holy of holies in the Old Testament. That's where the presence of God was, and the only person that could go in there was the high priest. And he only once a year, and, and then only after he went through all that sacrificial, you know, dressing and offerings and such, he could only go in there in a way prescribed because God's presence was there. He says, we make a place for God's presence, that holy presence when we get together. Isn't that awesome? So how we are, how we do life, how we interact with one another determines to what degree the presence of God is here. How many want the presence here? So I have to ask myself, what am I doing to court the presence of God? What am I doing to add to the atmosphere? If, you, if you're watching on Facebook and, and you're part of another church, what are you doing? If you're here at Victory Church, what am I doing? What are you doing to create an atmosphere where God can do something in somebody's life? How many know we either are positive or negative in the atmosphere of any meeting we attend? Yes or no? You either attract or you detract? Yes or no? It's challenging to think about. I don't know about you, but ever since I've been saved, I always wanted to add to anywhere I was. That doesn't mean anybody needs to see my face. People don't need to hear my voice. But when I get there, my presence says, I've been with Jesus. I'm praying. I'm expecting God to do something in this house. I'm expecting God to do something in other people's lives. I'm expecting God to, to do something in the praise and worship. I'm expecting God to do something when the minister ministers the word. I'm expecting the word to have an effect in people's lives because I'm asking him to. How many know if you do that, you can have a positive effect? Yeah, isn't that good? So, uh, uh, anyway, number three, don't let yourself be used like a cancer cell. That's a challenge. Matthew 12, 25, Jesus knew their thoughts, replied, any kingdom divided by civil war is doomed. A town or family spent, splintered by feuding will fall apart. Now, here's America today. Our biggest challenge is not the international enemies we have. Our biggest challenge right now is ourselves. And that's what Jesus said, a house divided against itself and you can see how the enemy has snipped away at the unity of the American culture over the last number of years and now you can't even talk about politics is it true you can't bring it up in church people get mad they'd leave they'd fuss you out is it true is it a problem have we yielded to the enemy as a whole yes it's something to think about 
There'll be a cancer cell. You know, think about the DNA. Think about the cells of your body making up you. Think about the unity of your body as long as you're eating properly, doing the things you need to do to keep yourself up. You know, your body will generally fight off diseases and all that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, scientists tell us that generally speaking, all of us have cancer cells in our bodies just about at any point in time. But your body's made in such a way it fights off all that stuff. It's got a great defense system. Aren't you glad? Having said that, there are cancer cells. Here's the question. We could be a cancer. The cancers, what does a cancer cell do? It's a cell that, that something has invaded that cell, mutated that cell, and that cell has fought against itself, and then that cell begins to fight against the other cells in the body, and it just mutates, and it grows, and it hinders the body. The very thing that was supposed to cause unity call, causes decay, and eventually disaster and death, Right? So in the human body, cancer cells, something, so, something negative is introduced. And then that cell is changed. Then that cell affects another cell, which affects another cell, which affects another cell, and which creates a growth. And there you go. The cancer is blown up and it's growing. Did you know that happens in a church family? Anytime you speak negatively about another person and not in their presence, you talk negatively about leadership, talk negatively about others. How many know it's just like a cancer? Yes or no? I know it's challenging to talk about. We got to talk about it. Anytime, and this is in my notes, anytime you voice dissent to anyone about what you don't like, what you disagree with, or about a person you don't like, you're being used like the cancer cells of a body, being used by the enemy to bring ill health. Those are some challenging things to say, aren't they? Having said that, you know what? The values here at Victory Church, I deeply value suggestions. I like for people to say, have you ever considered this? What about doing this? What do you think about this? How many know that's positive and not negative? But we're to never use our words to tear someone else down or to talk about them in a despairing way. I have to say this in our church family, not that I even think it's going on right now, but you know what? Outside of these walls, it's going on in businesses. It's going on with respect to our country and its government. It's going on everywhere at all times. And now people have, have some uncanny uh, permission somehow, and I think it's I think it's from the internet, and I think it's social media to say what they want to say, the way they want to say it, to the disregard of how it fa- affects another person. How many know that's wrong? Yes or no? But I want to encourage you: be careful on social media. Be careful with what you say and how you say, and what you speak and how you speak about and to another person how many know it just doesn't affect you it just doesn't affect them and you know what it doesn't just affect the body at large in a church family how many know it also affects jesus himself and i'll conclude i won't get through tonight i didn't think i would the way we treat each other is the way we treat jesus himself very very clear in scripture i just got two scriptures and i'll close with this so you guys can come on up and get behind me and get ready. Acts 9, 4, he fell to the ground, heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Saul was going around having people put in prison for the, uh, for the cause of Christ because, of, because they named the name Jesus. He was persecuting believers. When Jesus blinded him, he dropped to the ground. Jesus said, you're persecuting me, dude. So think about it this way. When I speak in a despairing way, when I sow something negative, when I sow a negative seed in somebody else's ear about someone else, I'm doing that to Jesus himself. If I have a bad attitude, a negative word, something that's non-complimentary that I say about another believer, how many know I'm treating Jesus that way? So when I go to pray, he's got something to say. Can we talk about how you've been treating me? I take this further in my life, the way I treat Susan is the way I treat Jesus. Because she's in the body of Christ. If you're married, your spouse is in the body of Christ. Jesus can't treat me any better than I treat her. Phew. Isn't that true? My children, they lived in my home. The way I treat my children is the way I treat Jesus himself. Is that right? 
That means, yes, I need to love them, respect them. I need to discipline them. But you know what? I need to respect them as human beings and love them like I love myself. Right? Well, there's a lot to think of. It gets quiet in this Baptist church. Matthew 25, 40, and the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. So the way I treat you, the way I treat, I'm treating him. So I just ask myself this question fairly regularly. How have I treated Jesus today? The answer to that is how I've treated you, what I've said to you, the kind of notes I've written to you, the things I've said on Facebook about you. Or the things I've tweeted about you. Or the things I've put on Instagram about you. Or the notes that I've written and put in the mail to you. Or or the phone conversations I've had with you. Or the conversations I've had with other people that may be about you. That's the way I treat Jesus. And if I want him to honor me, and I want his word to work in my life, I've got to honor him in everybody else. How many get it? We're living in a fierce time. It's really hard to live today. How many have felt the pressure of today like no other day in, in, in your life? Raise your hand. I got, okay, 15. How about the rest of you? Y'all alive? Yeah, of course, of course. It's a tough day. I have never felt the pressure that I feel today. And you know what that means? We need each other more today than we ever have in, in my whole life. Would you agree with that? So what do you say we work together and let's have the same DNA? I want you to think about it. Every time you come to Victory Church, we have a DNA here. Love, care, compassion, helpfulness, you know, dignity, caring for others, believing the best of the other person. That's what we're all about. Let me encourage you in this. If you hear anybody anywhere say it, making a derogatory comment about anybody else not in their presence, why don't you kindly just grab them by the hand and instead of letting your ears hear that kind of thing, what about you say, let's pray for them right now and ask God to minister life to them. How many know if you do that, it's like eating blueberries and raspberries and strawberries and all those deep, dark, rich vegetables that keep cancer cells out of your human body. How many know when you do that kind of stuff, you keep the mess out? Is that true? How many want to help me do that?